Hey guys, <laughs> welcome back to Four Eyes, the podcast series that gives you a clear view into the optometry world across Canada and the U.S. We are your hosts. I'm Dr. Defon Carr. I'm Dr. Amrit Bilku. I am Dr. Ravinder Mandela. And I'm Dr. Alex Kuhn. Um, okay, so I guess this is our third installment of the new grad case reflection series. And in our last case reflection episode, check it out if you haven't listened to it yet. Um, Rab talked about managing anterior uveitis. And today we are still going to ride that uveitis yeah, wave, wave. <laughs> or train <laughs> or horse <laughs> or car. Yes. Ooh, yes. I don't know how to, oh, I guess we or can. reasonable yeah. mode of transportation. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because I'm going to be talking about a case uh, that involves similar clinical findings amongst many other things. But with that, we will get started. Um, this case presented to me during my first or second month of practicing as a new grad. So I was practicing in a solo non-dispensing clinic and was completely by myself and probably scared all the time. Um, so it was a like Saturday afternoon and I was getting ready for my last patient of the day and a 28 year old, uh, white female presented to the clinic for the first time for a routine eye examination. She complained of gradual blurring of spectacle corrected vision in both eyes over the past three months. And upon further questioning, she reported having unremarkable medical history. She reported no systemic conditions and she said she was not taking any medications. So, you know, like at this point I was thinking, all right, she likely needs an update with her glasses prescription and I'm going to go home pretty early this Saturday. Yeah. Afternoon. No worries. <laughs> so, um, on examination, the auto refraction results showed minimal myopia of like minus 1.5 diopters in both eyes and lensometry of her current glasses showed similar results. Mm -hmm. um, her corrected VAs were 2080 in the right eye and then 2150 in the left. Yikes. I also, yeah. So yeah. I did pinhole testing, which showed no improvement in both eyes. Mm -hmm. um, and then her IOPs with NCT was 14 in the right eye and 17 in the left. So I tried to do a quick refraction on her and I could not improve her VAs in either eye. So then with her anterior segment evaluation, it revealed two plus white blood cells, um, which is about 16 to 25 cells in the anterior chamber in each eye. She had a round reactive right pupil and in the left eye, she had posterior synechiae at the two, four, eight, and 10 o'clock position, creating an irregular cloverleaf pupil. The left eye also displayed approximately 20. <laughs> mutton. Or, I'm sorry, I already scared like, Amrit. She's out. I'm, she's out. She's like, I'm done. I'm, I don't I'm wanna. Not a, yeah. No. Yeah, how, did, how do you think no, I felt? I was like, greatest. okay. Um, the left eye also displayed approximately 20 mutton fat keratic precipitates accumulated along the inferior corneal endothelium. Mm -hmm. And that's not all my friends. <laughs> she oh, also gosh. had retinal photos taken and she had what appeared to be like grade one bilateral optic nerve edema. And so at that point I was like, I ain't going I'm home. I'm going to be sleeping here tonight, <laughs> this Saturday afternoon, oh, man. <laughs> figuring out what's going on. So Yikes. With all that exam information so far, what are you guys thinking could be potentially going on? I'm thinking like some sort of like pan uveitis, just mm -hmm. everything. Everything. Yeah. Yeah. Inflammation in the front, in the middle, in the back. Um, yeah. I, what I'm, in, the initial thing that I would think is she said no to all medical and systemic history, either, yep. either A, she's, hiding something that she doesn't want to share that she might be mm -hmm. embarrassed to share or B she, she's saying no, because maybe her last physical was like 10 years ago. So like clearly mm -hmm. nothing might've been updated in a long time. 
Cause there's yeah. no way that could be benign findings of just like a random occurrence. So yeah. Yeah. But a lot of time, like these findings are like chronic things mm-hmm. where a patient doesn't have any symptoms. Mm-hmm. And then you see this, these stuff on a regular eye exam. And yeah. then you wonder like, how, like, how do you, do not notice anything in your vision? Like, how did you not notice like yeah. anything? Like how, how are yeah. you getting my but- life? You know what though? Like I think about that in myself too, though. Once, once a condition is chronic, you know, you're living that same symptom every single day. Yeah. It's, it's literally your normal now, right? Like I have so many things wrong with like my arm and sometimes my knee like pops <laughs> and everyone else listening and like, what is that? And I'm like, yeah, I've had this for 15 years. And they're like, that's not normal. And I'm like, well, it's normal for me. It shows up every day. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so yeah, it's crazy. Normal when it doesn't show up. Yeah. Um, I had the <laughs> same exact thoughts as you guys. I was like, I'm not really sure like what else to ask. So I again <laughs> asked about her medical history yeah. and like if she, if she had any systemic or autoimmune conditions, um, she still at that point reported nothing. I then went on to ask her if anything in her life or environment had changed in the past year. And she did briefly mention getting a tattoo on her uh, right arm about Mm -hmm. eight months ago that was elevated, but that was it. So um, what diagnostic tests would you consider next at this point? Dilation for sure. Mm Mm-hmm. So dilate, um, see if we, we see any, um, posterior cells, even old pigmented cells, mm-hmm. um, do an Macular OCT swelling too. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. OCT, see how much of the swelling it is, or like, is it edema from drusen or is it actual mm-hmm. true edema? Mm-hmm. Um, and then, um, I think we talked about this earlier, like doing AF photos to, mm-hmm. um, discern the difference between drusen and, um, um, edema, optic nerve head edema. Mm -hmm. So getting back to what Rav said, I actually didn't dilate her because I was worried about the posterior synechiae in the left eye. Mm -hmm. I felt that if I were to break that irregular shaped synechiae, I would possibly damage her iris. And I was, Mm -hmm. yeah, kind of worried about that. So I didn't dilate her. But I did continue on with an optic nerve head and MAC OCT because I wanted to know if I was observing bilateral optic nerve edema or drusen. And I wanted to know if anything was going on Mm -hmm. with the macula because of the reduced vision in both eyes, right? Mm -hmm. So at that clinic, I was lucky enough to have an OCT. And on OCT, I did a five-line raster on both the optic disc and macula, which just takes like sectional cuts of the tissue, right? And in the optic nerve head OCT, there was no hyper reflective material underlying the raised nerve tissue. So that made me lean more towards the patient having bilateral optic nerve edema. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and just back to what Rob was saying before, um, I just wanted to mention other ways you can decipher between optic nerve head drusen and papilledema. Um, which is fundus auto, autofluorescence. It's, that's what you said, Rev, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, where drusen will show up as hyper-reflective material on the a- FAF, and then also B-scan, where the drusen will, again, hyper-reflect. And then fluorescein angiography, where, you guessed it, the drusen will hyper-fluoresce, uh, right. <laughs> and the papilledema will show diffuse leakage, right? Yeah. And I did a five line OCT scan on her macula in both eyes. And that showed what appeared to be uh, a severe petaloid pattern cystoid macular edema oh. for which the left eye was much worse than the right, Shoot. which made sense because yeah. her VAs were so much more worse in the left eye versus the right. Yeah. So with all this information now, at this point, what would you guys do next? Refer out, go, leave, cry. <laughs> Rav, you're supposed to be the one who's handling all these UVI cases for us. <laughs> what? Well, I think in general, um, yeah, I think especially when it's pan-uveitis or posterior uveitis, um, it depends on 
everyone's scope of practice, but I think it's safe to say even across Canada and the U.S., optometry scope of practice for posterior uveitis is a bit limited compared to anterior uveitis. So Mm -hmm. I think in general, we all know that you'll have to get the, the MD involved and their family doctor. But I think in general, like what I would assume that I can at least do is now start the blood work, right? So in our previous new grad case reflection episode, we did go over the certain blood work that you can go through mainly for like anterior uveitis. I don't know if everything that we talked about though would cover like Mm -hmm. um, things that would cause pen or posterior uveitis, but I would get that blood work list first. In my mind, that would be the first thing to do. So for like the posterior uveitis, you're looking for like more um, systemic conditions like Mm -hmm. syphilis testing, TB, um, even herpes as well, Uh, sarcoid. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Sarcoidosis, um, that's another big one. Yeah. Lyme disease. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, basically what Rav said there, I ended up calling the on call ophthalmologist right yeah. away um, because I wanted her to be seen right away. Like, mm-hmm. I, I was nervous and I was like, oh my God, we got to figure out what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, so, I explained all my findings to the on call ophthalmologist and he was like, okay, I'm going to see this patient the next day on a Sunday yeah. morning in his clinic. Yeah. So he was like, yeah, I, I, I'll see this patient tomorrow morning. Mm-hmm. Um, so the patient saw the ophthalmologist the next day. And one more time after that, um, he then sent me a report detailing his findings about three weeks later um, when I was going to follow up with her. Mm-hmm. So the letter back was like a very detailed letter where the ophthalmologist I felt like essentially explained his thought process and how he Mm -hmm. initially managed the patient at each visit I think it was this detailed because of how complex he also thought the case was wow Um, most of the time my letters back from ophthalmologists are not this detailed it's literally like this is what it is. The patient's fine. Leave me alone. Don't send them (laughs) back. (laughs) It's like, I have like two full page pages of of him like writing as to what was going on, which I was so thankful of Mm -hmm. um, because I learned a lot from this. I love when ophthalmologists do that. Like Mm -hmm. it, it's yeah like you learn so much and you learn their thought of process exactly yeah so they have something similar you kind of know if you can deal with it or should you be referring out if you want to start a treatment beforehand Mm -hmm. um yeah yeah Yeah, so I thought that was so nice of him to do that and I was just like oh wow okay awesome um so he confirmed the OCT findings of bilateral optic nerve head edema and cystoid macular edema with uh, fluorescein angi- angiography. Um, blood and lab work were also performed for which results were completely unremarkable. So also um, I made a note here that Eyes on Eye Care made a great uveitis labs cheat sheet on which tests should be ordered for anterior and posterior uveitis. Ooh, nice. so that would be a really good resource to look at if you're unsure of what to yeah. do. Um, so for treatment, um, after the first visit with the ophthalmologist, the patient was prescribed, um, 70 milligrams of prednisone per day, in addition to pred forte every hour to both eyes and a corticosteroid ointment in both eyes at night. She was seen two weeks later for follow-up with the ophthalmologist at which time she reported that her corrected vision in both eyes had significantly improved and she can now um, complete daily activities without issue. Mm -hmm. Um, On examination, her best corrected visual acuities were 20-25 in both eyes, which is like an enormous improvement. Um, And both anterior chambers were deep and quiet. Her left pupil still had the posterior synechiae uh, Mm -hmm. cloverleaf pupil and the same number of inferior mutton fat keratic precipitates. The CME had completely resolved in both eyes, but the optic nerve swelling was still present. Mm-hmm. Um, she also reported that her tattoo elevation had entirely resolved after two days on oh. the pred- prednisone. Mm. So, I mean, at this point, the treatment changed 
um, again, to a tapering of the pred forte in both eyes. Um, but she was still taking the corticosteroid ointment at night and the 70, uh, 70 milligram prednisone was still taken daily as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, at that time, no, yeah, go ahead. I have a quick thing. So, um, so even the ophthalmologist did not prescribe any sort of like cyclopentylate or atropine to no, he kind said, of break up the posterior sneaky. He said the same thing that I was concerned about. Like he was like, he talked to her about dial or using the atropine, but he also warned her that it can possibly damage her mm-hmm. iris in the left eye. So he was really guarded with that. Okay. And she was like, I don't want to do that then if that can potentially happen. So she didn't want to okay. um, do the atropine. Yeah. Interesting. Um, oh, so, so yeah, did that- dilate at her at all? Like was that posterior sneaky broken up when you saw her at all? Like it was still there? No, it was still there. Honestly, like, don't you have to break the posterior sneaky? That's what I was thinking. Cause that's what or, I thought too. I guess you should, I guess if we don't break up the sneaky, then we it, just it have gets to closely worse. monitor the IOPs, right? To make sure. I don't, that was the only, like, I'm not really sure. Cause I even had an attending during one of my rotations say that if it's the sneaky is bad enough, it can damage the iris and make it worse, mm-hmm. potentially affecting her vision. I don't know. Like that, I was, I was really worried. That's why I was really worried about dilating her. Cause I was mm-hmm. like, I don't know if I, but I thought the ophthalmologist was going to do it, but yeah. he was even like, uh, I don't know if this is a maybe good he idea. did dilate her, but he didn't prescribe her any atropine or yeah, like to like maybe because like she didn't her. have any flare and it's not like she was symptomatic because mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. like she didn't have any pain. So maybe he didn't need to prescribe atropine or, or yeah that's true but maybe he died like i don't know i feel like there's no way he didn't dilate her yeah because well he didn't mention it in his his note you have to like see they have to like rule out and yeah 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 posterior inflammation when posterior uveitis it's always in the periphery like oh yeah yeah, it's always yeah it's always like inferior you have to really dilate in order to see that but i guess but in this situation rav i guess it would be like are you going to get more information if you see cells yeah. in the vitreous versus like her nerves are already swollen, mm-hmm. her macula is swollen. So then at that point, it's maybe the ophthalmologist is like, well, it's already bad. When I did my rotation in Kentucky, I worked with a lot of ophthalmologists there and some of the ophthalmologists like with, um, for anterior seg stuff, they didn't always, or sorry, with posterior, um, inflammation, they didn't always dilate. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. I'm glad we talked about that. Cause yeah, even I was thinking, oh, maybe he just didn't want to dilate and break the sneaky because it's, it sounded like her IOPs were still within norms too. So like if there's no major threat to her getting an increase in IOP or anything else, then yeah. Just yeah. And Rob, he right could have, he, it. I just, he just maybe didn't put it in his note or it, dictate yeah. it in his note. Right. Like it can cause a pupillary block. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's true. He is so bad. Like you're risking losing your iris function compared to you going blind from pupillary. Maybe he's thinking that he would just fix it with like an LPI. Right. Oh, Oh, yeah. Like I didn't think about that. Uh, So, okay. So with all the lab and blood tests that had taken place and all the results coming back negative. So he, um, so the ophthalmologist made a diagnosis of tattoo associated bilateral acute panuveitis that was established. Um, The patient was also referred to dermatology to help with the elevated tattoo skin reaction and to rheumatology to help with the autoimmune like phenomenon caused by the ink in the tattoo. I ended up seeing the patient for the second two week follow up where the course of therapy was still continued. And at this follow-up, she was almost done with the pred forte, but still taking the oral prednisone daily and the corticosteroid ointment at night. Her BCVAs were still stable in both eyes at 2025. You know, she got an updated prescription. Um, Maculas appeared, you know, still healthy. And now the optic nerve swelling appeared to have resolved. She still had the posterior sneakyae, cloverleaf pupil, and inferior mutton fat keratic precipitates in the left eye, but no cells in the anterior chamber of both eyes. Um, 
And then she had another follow-up with the ophthalmologist in about two weeks again to see if she could taper or decrease the dosage of the oral prednisone. But I believe she was lost to follow up at this oh, point. Oh. So yeah. She um, probably was like, my vision's back. I'm done. Yeah, yeah I think right? that's, yeah. I also wanted to mention um, optometrists uh, can manage this particular case without an ophthalmologist in Alberta, Canada, because we can prescribe oral steroids and order our own blood and lab work. Mm -hmm. Um, But I definitely did not feel comfortable Mm -hmm. doing that. So I was really happy that I was able to co-manage this case with the ophthalmologist. And honestly, when I was referring her out to the ophthalmologist, I thought she was going to need intraocular steroid injections. (laughs) So I was like, okay, bye. (laughs) Like, yeah. So I would not be comfortable handling this case by by myself because again as a new grad you hear this maybe like one thing that pops up and then it's gonna like cloud your judgment with everything else going on Mm -hmm. and also if you really did handle this case by yourself I believe you could do it I believe you could totally handle it but then I feel like when the (laughs) blood work comes out normal then you're like yeah I don't know what the heck this is like yeah. if the blood works normal then you're just then it's like whoa I, I I don't know what I'm doing like if everything's normal so, what is this yeah so uh, jumping off of what you just said Amrit so mm-hmm. there's a you know a few things about tattoo associated uveitis it's a very rare ophthalmic complication that is incompletely understood um mm-hmm. there's not a lot of studies or data on it because it's so rare So a few key points, uh, coexisting inflammation of the eye and tattooed skin is a hallmark sign of tattooed uh, associated uveitis, especially if there is no systemic cause. Mm -hmm. So when the patient told me that her tattoo was raised, I actually had no idea that meant her tattoo was showing signs of inflammation Mm -hmm. or an uh, allergic reaction or even possibly tissue damage. Mm -hmm. So I don't have any tattoos of my own. I've never heard of a tattoo being raised or elevated or raised. So that was my first mistake in this case was not further questioning the patient about what do you mean or like observing it or Whenever I hear about a tattoo infected or raised or anything, I think about the clip from Bridesmaids. <laughs> she, has, oh. <laughs> she has the uh, tattoo on her back, or I think it's on her back, and then she's trying to put the peas on it, and she just dumps yeah. the peas on it. <laughs> yeah. Amarin and I would just be like, raised? What do you mean? Like, what does that even I mean? I thought that was the style of the tattoo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's raised? Yeah, so- oh, it's through, it's through the roof? That's oh. lit. Okay. <laughs> For our listeners, Rab has a full body tattoo. She never should. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Rab, what- <laughs> yeah. But what, do- what happens, you guys? Like, what's the, what does that mean? Yeah. Well, when you get it, like, it is slightly raised and it is like a lot darker. So it's almost like black. But over time, it kind of faints down. Mm-hmm. But like, m- mine wasn't like, painful or like maybe mm-hmm. the first couple of days it was like a little bit irritated but like after two to three days like it was fine like it didn't hurt or anything so I, I wonder what her tattoo looked like when she said it was raised like like how raised I was think, it yeah yeah because at the follow-up visit I did look at her the tattoo on that right arm where she mm-hmm. was like oh it's like back to normal and it looked completely flat to me then and I was like yeah. oh okay and then she did. She just told me it looked like, like literally like raised, like, like, mm-hmm. you know, what scar tissue, how it's a little yeah. bit raised. Yeah. That's what she said. It looked like. And but it was raised for, cause you said she was having these symptoms of gradual vision loss over three months. Mm-hmm. So I've, I've never gotten a tattoo, <laughs> but if it's going to be raised even like a, a couple of weeks after getting it, I'm already going to think, oh my God, something's wrong. Like I'm getting an allergic reaction or I wonder if she thought anything extra of that, knowing that, okay, it's been, you know, three, four, six months and my tattoo is still swollen or elevated. The interesting thing about this patient is she has multiple tattoos as well. So she's not someone that's new to them. I don't know. That's crazy. Like the uh, formulation of the ink. It could have been not a very sterile environment too. Yeah. That's. That's what I'm thinking too. Yeah, she <laughs> she did tell me she didn't go to the same place 
for this oh. particular tattoo, but she's been to multiple places. Yeah. So she was like, I didn't think anything of it. But mm-hmm. again, to, you know, piggyback off of what Amber was saying, um, typically the onset of uveitis develops six or more, six or more months after tattooing. Oh, and the wow. onset of uveitis and a tattoo skin reaction, like a raised tattoo, typically starts within a similar time period. So this helps to determine that the connection between skin and eye inflammation is not just coincidental, right? Mm -hmm. What I definitely learned is that all patients with uveitis should be asked whether they have any tattoos and Mm -hmm. then all tattoos should be thoroughly examined for signs of inflammation. Depends Um, on where those tattoos are. (laughs) Yes, that too. (laughs) You don't want to see all of them. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously <sighs> practice appropriately. <laughs> um, you know, you know what, actually, I'm going to say the best question that you mentioned asking patients with uveitis is when they say that they have no medical history, I'm asking, well, what's changed in your life mm-hmm. over mm-hmm. this time? And I, I ask my patients that anytime they say, you know, I have new headaches, I've never mm-hmm. had this type of a headache before. I'll always say, what's changed in your day-to-day activities? Did something stressful happen in your life in the last few months? Did you change jobs, change schools, whatever, get a new face cream? Mm -hmm. Like what are you eating differently now than you were four months ago? Yeah. I think it's a really important question to ask, especially if the patient's like, I don't have anything systemically going on. I'm not on any medications you know, I I saw my family physician a year ago, they said my blood work was fine. At that point, I'd be like, uh, okay, you know, obviously, you're like, what, what else, what else could be going on before you think of referring, Mm -hmm. you know, asking about tattoos would be a really good question. Mm -hmm. And if anything, again, changed in their life in the past, like, year, I usually ask that question when I'm like, I have nothing no else. idea <laughs> what, what's happening. <laughs> and I'm like grabbing at straws, trying yeah. to figure yeah. out what's yeah. going on. Um, yeah. But yeah. yeah. Even like yeah. just telling the patient, even if you think it's not relevant to the eyes, still just tell, tell me. Tell me. Something yeah. Changed, right? like, yeah. Going to, kind yeah. of going back to my UV at his patients, like when I asked him about back pain, he's like, oh, like I always had this and it's because I work in construction. Like he, he didn't even think that it was anything related um, mm-hmm. to anything else other than his work where, you know, where he actually had an underlying autoimmune condition. Mm-hmm. So um, yeah, just tell them, be like, just give me, just give me everything. Give me all the details and yeah. I'll pick out what I yeah. need. Yeah. Well, you know, what's funny is after Rav, we did your case, I yeah. had a patient that came in that he showed up with a red eye and mm-hmm. it said he had arthritis. And I was like, what kind of arthritis do you have? Yeah. And he's like ankylosing spondylitis. And I was oh, like, wow. oh, <laughs> <laughs> <Let> me." <laughs> that was like before I looked at his eyeball and everything. And I was like, because there's so many different types, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. Okay. So wait, so management options include like local steroids, systemic prednisone. Also, if, um, the oral prednisone was not alleviating the inflammation, the ophthalmologist, the ophthalmologist explained that he would put her on a stronger Mm -hmm. oral steroid, like methodextrate. Um, the other management options include excision of the tattooed skin. If it's bad enough, in order to avoid, you know, blinding Mm -hmm. complications that can involve like glaucoma, macular edema and retinal um, issues. And then these patients should also be strongly advised to avoid getting additional tattoos, you know, as this may worsen Mm -hmm. their uveitis. Oh, do they ever, um, did they ever do any long-term studies on these patients to see if there's recurrence of like from the same tattoos, even like years later? I don't know if they have like some yeah. the studies on here on tattoo associated uveitis is so, so rare. rare and far in between that it's I don't think they probably don't have a lot of long-term studies yeah. on it I, I don't I don't know mm-hmm. yeah that was a really cool case I think yeah. everything that you said you did I think is exactly what at least I would do like even if it's in our yeah. scope of practice it's just you know someone's life is on the line and that's not the time for us to be 
like playing God with their life. Just, you know, have all of their doctors involved, have multiple people collaborate the care, get second opinions, even if you know exactly what to do, you know, at least get a second opinion and just have someone on your side to, to deal with the case like this, especially when it's pan uveitis, like everything is getting affected. You don't want to be the sole doctor responsible for that. No matter what the outcome is. I know. I think as soon as I saw all that information, I was in my head, I was like, you need to leave my chair and be seen by someone else. I was just like, I, I don't know. That Saturday yeah. was very stressful for me. Yeah. And it was a, like, she was my last patient too. So what I was did like, you go home. I think <laughs> I had a really long conversation with the ophthalmologist yeah. when I was talking to him, we almost talked for about 30 minutes. Cause he was asking oh. me like all these questions, especially mm-hmm. since she said no to all the systemic yeah. um, conditions questions. And he was like, well, did she have this? Did she have that? And I was like, uh, no. Yeah. And this was my first time, I think, referring out or calling the on-call ophthalmologist. Mm-hmm. So it started with a bang. <laughs> it started with a bang. And I think it traumatized me a little bit because now every time I have to call an on-call ophthalmologist, I was like, oh my God, it's going to be like a 50 minute conversation of them asking me all these questions that I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. So it was, yeah, it just, I was sweating. I had beads yeah. of sweat just <laughs> coming down. <laughs> dripping down my sweet innocent face and I was just like, <laughs> you got your workout in you didn't need to work I got out my workout yeah I think <laughs> I think after I told um my uh, the other associate doctor that worked there about this case he was like oh I'm glad I didn't work that <laughs> and I was like yeah man like this is like I'm just fresh out of school and you know this is like so scary and he's like but that's good like you're fresh out of school you got the first scary one out of the way now you're going to be chill for everything out when that rest- No, they're going to be worse next time. They're going to be missing one eye and they're not going to know where it went. <laughs> well, um, for everyone listening to this episode, again, please feel free to uh, comment on our IGTV episode when this is out or comment on any of our stories or posts related to this episode and let us know any other like information that was interesting to you anything else that you want to add on how to approach or manage pan uveitis and just to teach us and share your knowledge. Um, that's what this episode is for just to share everything we know, share our feelings, our emotions, and make sure everyone is just comfortable opening up about what they know and how they feel. So yeah. Thank you again, everyone for listening and tune in next week for another new episode of our podcast. Bye. Bye. Bye.